we we don't have uh, formal opening statements, but in sort of in, in lieu of that, uh, I wanted to ask you all, I'll tweak it a little bit since we have one incumbent and one challenger. We'll start with you, Ms. Kirby, uh, Dr. Kirby. Uh, if you had to sort of uh, put a, a note on what was the main reason that prompted you to run? What 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 was the sort of the mo main motivator? What was that? Oh, sure. Um, so, you know, my kids were always in public school up until the point where COVID happened. And um, they went on online for the first year, like a lot of families did, because we were worried about COVID. Um, when I tried to bring them back into school, the mask mandates had started. Um, so I homeschooled for a year, tried to bring them back in again. And then the, the mandates happened again after I told that I had written up to the school that it was optional. Um, and I was pretty upset about that. I have a daughter with ADHD and dyslexia and the mask really doesn't work for her learning and she gets anxiety from it. And my son feels sick when he wears it. So um, there wasn't really a way to uh, get an excuse for that. So, um, you know, I, I would say I was an upset parent. You know, I, I got on Facebook. I met with some other parents who were pretty upset. There's large groups of us, actually. Um, and that's really what started this whole thing. So that's how it all began for me. Okay. And and I'll I'll tweak that for you, Ms. Gallo. Uh, this is obviously your 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 second time. I guess I would ask, uh, why run again? What didn't you uh, finish in your first term that you'd like to see in your second? Sure. Thank you for that question. So yeah, so I'm running for re-election. As we all know, we had the global pandemic, which for two years we were really just dealing with the fallout of that. We were trying to keep schools open. We were trying to keep kids in schools. We were trying to keep instruction happening so that our kids can learn. So it, it took two years out of my term out. So I wasn't able to really accomplish everything that I wanted to in the in the first four years. So I'm really focused on um, you know career and technical education. I'd like to see that expanded. Dual enrollment. Those are some things that we have haven't been able to focus on due to the pandemic. I'm concerned with what we are calling the COVID slide. Um, I've done a lot of research on absenteeism and what that means for kids um, with the academic gap. So I'm really focused on the student making sure that they're successful, making sure that they have the resources that they need so that they can graduate and be, you know, a productive part of society. That I mean, there's still a lot that we need to do in the next four years. One of the things that you know you're going to have to do is welcome a new superintendent. And um, I'd like both of you to talk briefly about your expectations for whoever that person ends up being, but just, just what would you like to see in the first year? So I'll I get Yeah, we'll start with you. Okay, great. So uh, Maria Vasquez, Dr. Vasquez will be our new superintendent for Orange County Public Schools. Mm -hmm. I think that she is a great choice. Um, mm -hmm. What I expect from her um, is to be a leader that's involved in the community. Mm -hmm. I expect that she will continue along the road with the academic games that gains that we've made and continue to make. I want her to be in the community. I want us to be more transparent. We have a morale issue with our teachers. We are losing teachers at a high rate and we've got some real, real challenges ahead of us. And I think that she is the right person to deal with some of those challenges. So, you know, I expect, I really want us to feel more like a family at OCPS. I want teachers to feel heard and seen. I want our administrators to know that they are valued and I want our kids to know that they are welcome um, at all of our schools. And I want her just to really focus on the community. She is bilingual. I think that's very important for our community. 43% of our, our children, our students are, are Hispanic. And I think that that, would be, that will be a great representation for them as she goes, goes through the community and, and meets people. And Dr. Kirby? I would agree with um, having someone involved in the community. It's super important. But uh, where I would differ is I would say that we want somebody that would, and this is, again, a lot of the parents and some of the teachers that I've spoken to, uh, want somebody that will actually um, put into place and hold people accountable when they stray from our new laws that DeSantis has signed in um, regarding the inappropriate curriculum items and things like that. Um, teachers are still looking for a better conversation, more of a raise. I think I know that there was one proposed. I don't know that everybody's happy with that. I think we still have a long way to go, um, even with um, having, and, and the ties to the community also need to be with the parents, because right now parents still don't have a voice with our board. I know that things get escalated and they don't really get addressed. Um, so those are things that 
you know, the superintendent will get a lot of those complaints as well. And they need to be handled. They need to, parents need to be heard and teachers need to be heard. So that's really what we need to change on both sides. We were talking about uh, Dr. Vasquez being bilingual, right? Uh, we know that Orange County has a, a huge uh, Latino community, a huge underserved community in general, including the uh, Black community, Asians, and it keeps expanding, right? I wanted to know what what is both of your take into now that with so many laws that have been implemented, like the anti-woke law, for example, and many people uh, kind of talking to the, the necessity of talking about diversity, inclusion, and equity more important than, than anything, right? But there's certain limits now of what can be discussed and what can't be discussed. So I wanted to know where each of you stand um, with all this in terms of diversity, equity, inclusion, and should this be discussed or shouldn't this be discussed in, in schools? If we can start with Ms. Kirby. I think absolutely diversity is important. You know, people are different. They have different thoughts. They have different experiences that should be shared. I think the line is though, where sometimes it, the boundary is where you cross over into what a parent would be teaching their child and how they want their children raised. And you don't want to be stepping on that boundary. And that's kind of what's gone on. Um, so absolutely accept everyone, support kids in crisis, support, you know, teachers that have kids that are in crisis, all of that. And, you know, having diversity is amazing, but there has to be a fine line because as we've seen over the past couple of years, um, the line has been crossed and it's been stomped on. So that was, you know, it needs to be updated. And I think we need to follow the laws. Mrs. Gallo. I think that diverse, uh, diversity and inclusion are extremely important as is equity. You know, I, I look at equity as lifting all children up, not taking away from one child to give to the other child. I 100% support parental rights. I think that parents being involved in the education and being an active participant in ed education is really important. It's one of the leading indicators of student success. We know that when a parent's involved, that that child's gonna be more successful. So we absolutely support that and wanna see that at OCPS. I think that when we do a deep dive into the school grades that have just come out, we're gonna see the inequities. We're gonna see them when we look at our geometry scores. I think we're gonna see them when we look at our algebra scores. Um, we, we, did, we did really well considering that we had a global pandemic. When you look at our school grades, we're gonna be a B district, but we did, we did maintain and we did make some gains. But when you do that deep dive, you're gonna see the inequities in our, Latin, you know, in our Latin community, our Hispanic community, in our black community, in our low poverty community. You see the disparities there and we absolutely we have to address those. Every child is entitled to a fair and appropriate education, including our, our children with disabilities. And we need to make sure that we are providing the appropriate resources and we're giving them what they need to succeed. So we need to, we need to continue with those services that we provided. Um, the laws that have passed, um, we, we will adhere to them. We, we, I'm a constitutional officer. I'm here to follow the law. Uh, we do need a little bit more guidance from the Department of Education, uh, who I talked to two weeks ago about what that will look like, because right now those laws that have passed have really given a lot of confusion to our teachers and to our parents about expectations, what will be allowed, won't be allowed next week. And we really, really need guidance and clarification so that when school starts, we can, we can provide them with, um, up-to-date appropriate information so that they know how to conduct and teach in their classroom. If I could follow up uh, real quick with, with a statement that you just made, I completely agree that involved parents make definitely a better education for kids. Unfortunately, it's not the reality, especially for many underserved communities in which parents pretty much work uh, from dawn to night, right? And sometimes they barely see their children. Uh, if elected, how would you work towards situations like that one where the how involved the parent can be uh, is very limited and in cases where sometimes a parent doesn't even speak the language. So being involved is definitely uh, a challenge if we can start with you again, um, since you made the comment. Me? Okay, yeah. okay, great. Um, that's a great question. So it is it is more difficult to involve parents in those low socioeconomic areas, right? They're busy. They're working two to three jobs. They're trying to put food on the table. They're trying to pay rent. And we all know that during these times of inflation, that's increasingly difficult. Um, so we need to we need to be out in the community. We need to be reaching out to them. We need to be working with our PTAs, with our PTOs, with stakeholders in that community to engage those parents. They need to see themselves reflected in their schools. They need to see people that look
look like them, act like them in their schools so that, so that they feel comfortable coming in, engaging. And that means having people in those schools that speak their language. A lot, a lot of parents only speak Spanish. They don't, or Creole or whatever language that they speak, they don't speak English. So making, you know, stuff available in multiple languages, having somebody at that school so that when they call and need to inquire about their student or they need more information that we're able to communicate to them is important. And I think that's what I'm so excited about um, Dr. Vasquez is, is her ability to be able to communicate in, in dual languages, in, in Spanish and English. I think, I think little boys and girls will look at Dr. Vasquez and realize that that they're represented and that they're seen in Orange County. Thank you. Ms. Kirby? Yeah, and my answer to that, it's similar. Um, I think there could be way more communication, way better communication from the schools to the parents um, on the needs. And even though the parents work a lot, like a lot of us do, um, and I don't think that's just the underserved communities. I think that's parents in general. And as our economy gets worse, we all struggle. Um, so, you know, everybody's having to do that. It's every parent and there still needs to be better communication on what, what the students need and, and, you know, what's in the curriculum and how can the parents um, help from a distance even, but be involved. And I think that we could do way better with that. So we need to more communication for sure. I wanted to ask one of the questions. It gets a little awkward, uh, but uh, whenever we ask have a challenger, I think the uh, number one question any voter faces is, is why should they not vote for someone who they voted for before, in that case, uh, Ms. Gallo? And so for Ms. Kirby, I guess I would just not to put too fine a point on it, you know, what is it that you think you, you, you can bring that the, the parents and residents of this district are not getting? I just think that uh, sometimes having a, a fresh pair of eyes on things, a different, sorry about the dog. <laughs> um, so, uh, and then having, having someone that can look at it objectively. Um, sometimes I feel like once you're in a position, you get kind of stuck in the way things are being done instead of how we could do it better. And, have, and looking at it from that scope and lens, I think is, is needed right now. I think again, like the communication to the parents um, I know I've been to board meetings. I don't feel like we have a lot of time to speak, um, to, to bring issues. And I feel like that's a big problem. I know a lot of parents feel that it is. Um, I know some of the agenda-based stuff that parents have talked about, like you mentioned, the woke agenda, that is going to be handled through laws. But I still think there's a lot of people that feel, even though those laws are going to, are, you know, have been signed, they need to be implemented in the schools. And are we going to have people that are actually going to follow those? And I know, Angie Gallo said she will, but it is hard when you have a lot going on, you know, um, or maybe, I don't know if people feel uncomfortable kind of bringing that issue to someone that they've worked with for a long time, but these things need to happen. We need people to stand up and say like, you know, we got to follow the laws. The children need like a solid education. And right now I feel like, you know, we just dropped a whole grade and um, there are kids graduating that still aren't proficient in reading and math and writing, and we need to get a handle on that. Okay. And on the flip side of that, Ms. Gallo, what, what do you think uh, experience, uh, what, what advantage does that provide? I found out really quickly in 2018 or 2019, really, because I, I began in November, that there's a, there's a, there is a huge learning curve to being a school board member. You have these ideas, you have these great proposals, and you think you can walk in, and you realize rather quickly that I'm just one. I'm one of eight, eight board members um, to get things accomplished. I will say that as far as communication, I have always had an open door policy. I have emails. I try to be extremely responsive to my emails. Um, Anybody can call me. My phone number is out there for anybody who wants to see it. It's readily available. They can text me. I try to work really hard to communicate with my constituents because I, I'm, I serve at the pleasure of them. I don't serve the pleasure of OCPS. And I think that um, Mrs. Kirby's right in our, in our communication. We've said it from the dais a few times. We can do a better job. But part of that challenge is trying to get people and parents to to listen because we do we get complaints about communicating too much about the amount of connect oranges that we send out or the amount of texts and emails that we send to our parents so we do try with fidelity to communicate um in the best ways ways possible um so i think i think what i bring to the table is experience over the last four years we've been through the pandemic it's been extremely tough the life lessons and just the lessons learned from that, I think will help me. And I'm committed to making sure that everybody 
um, is successful when they graduate. And we do sit at a 97% graduation rate. Like we're one of the highest in the States with our graduation rate. I want to follow up on something that sort of blends together uh, two topics both of you just mentioned. Um, the, I think uh, Ms. Gallo, you mentioned scores that are, are sort of uh, dropping. We've had read reports that only 25% of third graders are demonstrating proficient reading levels that's statewide. Less than half are posting the desired uh, algebra scores. The number of A and B rated schools is dropping. Yet when I look at the legislation coming out of Tallahassee, very little of that uh, is focused on reading and writing and what I think people generally consider to be basic education. We've got the parental rights, don't say gay, uh, stop woke, uh, critical race theory. So I guess my question to you, starting with you, uh, as Gallup is, do you believe the laws that are coming out of Tallahassee are really what's needed to improve uh, education in this state? And if not, uh, what should we be doing? That's a great question. So I think, you know, at the end of the day, I'm always going to be focused on the child and the child's needs and how we can provide resources to make sure that the child is as successful as possible. I think we do need to do, we, we do need to focus more on the academics. We need to focus more on the achievement gaps. I feel like Lately, when we talk about narrowing the achievement gaps, we talk about lowering the ceiling versus rising the floor. And I don't think that's a good way to narrow the achievement gap. So I think we need to be ultra focused on academics, on reading, and, and provide resources to the districts that will help us prepare students for their future. We, we you know, I, I think that we did pretty well. I think the, the scores that we saw, I don't think that anybody was surprised with with what we saw from the state. Here in Orange County, I think our third grade was around 50%. The algebra and geometry scores that I saw were a little disappointing. So we know we definitely have work to do. So yeah, we need to focus on, on the academics. We need to focus on things that matter to kids. We need to focus on affordable housing. There are so many things that we need to focus on that will truly make a child's life better. A child who isn't fed can't learn. A child who has a toothache can't learn. A child who's not mentally, um, they are or is traumatized, can't learn. We need to focus on the mental health of our children. We need to make sure that they're fed. We need to make sure that they have health care. We need to make sure that they're taken care of so that when they come to school and they open up a book, they're ready and they're able to learn. That's how we that's how we we fix the achievement gap. Okay. And Ms. Kirby, I, I, I got, excuse me, Dr. Kirby, I think you had uh, mentioned some support for some of the laws that have uh, passed the legislature, but uh, do, do you think that a lot of what's come out of Tallahassee is uh, going to help uh, bolster, say, algebra scores or, or writing abilities, and if not, what we need to do to that end? Um, I actually do, because I think when you take out a lot of the things that are more socially related and really important to adults, um, the kids can focus on the basics that they need to learn and these scores will go up. So I do think it will help. Okay, thank you. I wanted to ask about something and, and I've been bringing this up in lots of school board interviews and it always kind of makes people smile. Um, Orange County has a wide variety already of um, career academies, um, programs that provide certificates, um, uh, dual enrollment, um, programs that basically allow students to leave school with either a good head start or career ready. Um, where do you see the potential for expansion for that um, in Orange County if you think it needs to be expanded? Um, and start with Dr. Kirby. Hey, sorry. So um, I love the idea of it. I've listened on some, some meetings about how they have the program in place. Um, I need to learn more about it, but I think we should expand into like several industries that we aren't already in to give kids a choice. Um, so I need to look up more. I know that they had some technical ones, but I think um, I'm not sure if there's like a agriculture already and stuff, but I think we, there's a lot we should do with um, specific to Florida that would really help the students. My other thing is I really would like to see more schools with these programs, not less, because I feel like every child in Orange County should have this pathway, you know? Remember One of my biggest priorities um, for the next four years is career and technical education. I think that here in Orange County, we, we do well. We have several centers scattered throughout 
Orange County. I'm very pleased that we're bringing Winter Park Technical to University High School. It's going to be real, real, real close in the east. We haven't had a technical college in the east outside of the one in Avalon, and this one's going to be focused on, on digital marketing and, and different items. So I'm super excited about that to be built. We absolutely need to expand career and technical education. Not every student needs to or wants to go to college. I think the last numbers I read was like 2.3 trillion dollars were in debt for student loans and some of those kids don't even graduate from college. So we need to expand access. We need to expose the children to it in elementary school. What I'm seeing and what I've seen over the last four years is the biggest barrier to career and technical education really is the parent because the parent wants to see that that student go to their child, like go to go away to school, go to a college, go to the football games, which is fine, but not every not every student needs to or wants to and we have some great career and technical education so we need to expand access we need to expand exposure we need to meet um, with our stakeholders within the market so we are driving market need we have a lot of needs here in central florida construction is one of the main ones and we need to make sure that we're kind of growing our own that we're filling the needs that our community knows um, that, that we need to fill. And we need to expand dual enrollment. I'm a big believer. I would love to see dual enrollment classes on every campus. The biggest problem or the barrier that we have for dual enrollment is the access to get down to Valencia to get to a campus. If you live in Lake Nona, it's great. You can walk across the street from Lake Nona High School, but outside of that, you have to have access. You have to have a car. And if you are, if anybody is from the East, you know that the transit system is not very reliable and not not much available out here on the East side. So we, we need to bring those, we need to bring those courses onto the campus so that all students have access to them. That's how, that's how we grow the programs. I also had a question about um, one of the toughest jobs the school board does, which is um, negotiations with the various employees unions that um, that represent school um, teachers, school workers, custodians, large, you know, everybody. Um, one of the things the legislature has done a couple times in the last couple years is pass extra money for salary enhancements that put very specific bands of employees that that are targeted by those. And I wanted to know, how do you approach these salary negotiations with that constraint? Do you think that that's something that school board members should be asking the legislature to stop doing? Or is it is it helpful when you go to sit down to negotiate salaries and in, in your opinion is, is it a good thing or a bad thing and um, i guess you'd start with um school member gala since you went last okay sure um so you're, you're talking about the constraints and the regulations that come down from tallahassee when we sit to negotiate with the unions correct yes um so yeah so i if i could if i could do pipe dreams i would i would love for that to be a district decision. I would love to remove the 33% that's required as part of the valuation on test scores. I would like to give that back to the district. Um, I, I think that the district knows, we know our teachers, we know which ones are successful, we know um, how they teach. We are the best the best ones to decide what is good for our students and good for our classroom. So I would like to lift some of the regulations because when we go into when we go into bargaining, with the unions, whether it's OSPA or CTA, um, we, you know, we have to, it's, it's, it's almost like a, a math project because it's, it's highly effective versus effective and effective can't make more than 50% of the highly effective, which is 75%. And if you're given a COLA, then you got to give a COLA, but the COLA can't be more than this. It's, it's, it's all very, very prescriptive in, um, in the, in statute. So it does prohibit us from really sitting down and and having a, a conversation and truly bargaining, doing collaborative bargaining with our union because our, our hands are tied on, on on certain things. Dr. Kirby? Yeah, I see where that would be an issue. Um, I'd like to, you know, if I, if, if I could get in and look at it, I would say that, yeah, less regulation is always better as far as I'm concerned. So um, anytime it would make it easier to help the teachers out and give them a better compensation package, I am for that. So absolutely. I wanted to thank you once again and then invite you to make a brief closing statement that would give us one more good pitch for why voters should choose you for this seat. So Rachel Kirby running for a District 1. Um, I believe that I have a strong background in leadership. 
um, I'm a fierce parent and um, we've gone through a lot over the past few years. And I feel that um, there's a large group of parents that want to see big changes. And I, I believe I can assist the board with making those changes. Um, I, I enjoy helping people and working with people. And um, I believe that our students need more from all of us and they deserve that. And I just think it's time for a change. So thank you. Thank you. And school board member Gala. Thank you. So I am running for re-election um, because as I mentioned before, there's a lot of work to, to be done. I have, I was, I was born and raised in central Florida. I've been married for 28 years. I've raised both of my children in East George County. They went through OCPS public schools. I got involved in advocacy kind of through the PTA SAC route. I've spent over 18 years advocating for parental and children in public education in Tallahassee. I worked on the recess bill, which allows students to have 20 minutes of, of free play every day that passed. I also worked hard and was instrumental in passing Baker Act reform. And the main tenet of that legislation was parental notification. So I understand that parents have a right to a student's education and we want parents to be involved in their education. Um, so I just, there's, we have a lot of work to do from the pandemic. We've, we've got some, some challenges ahead of us. And I think that I'm, I'm the best person to make good decisions for our community, for our parents and for our teachers. So I would just ask for the community support. 